Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk briefly about drop analysis in SOLIDWORKS. So many times you want to know the part that you designed, what's going to happen to it if it drops from your hand or from a height or anywhere, right? Is the stress in the part going to exceed? the yield strength or the ultimate strength and whether the part is going to deform permanently or it is going to break or anything like that. This is a very important analysis in many applications where there is a good chance that the design part, the design part can uh, fall uh, off your hand like a cell phone or anything else. So, uh, or you might just uh, have interest for other uh, reasons, like for example, if um, like a golf ball or a tennis ball or anything, right? If it's um, basically hitting a surface, what's going to happen to it? So although this is dropping, but um, if you simulate the condition properly so that the impact speed or the speed before collision for let's say a tennis ball with a surface or with a rocket kind of resembles the speed at which this uh, ball hits the floor and if you can uh, kind of um, set the parameters that I'll, I'm about to show you for the target surface in here which is the floor to match kind of the target surface in that um, let's say tennis ball or golf ball or something then uh, this uh, environment can help you. So here now I go to SOLIDWORKS and let's say here I have this ball and it is made of copper and I want to see what happens to it in a drop test. So I go to simulation, right? And then I click on new steady and then under the specialized simulation, I click on drop test and then I say, okay. And then I go to setup, right click on the setup, go to define, and then here you can determine the velocity at impact or the drop height. Let's keep it at drop height. Then do you want it to be measured from the centroid of the object or the lowest point? Again, here I keep it at centroid. How much? Here it says one meter. You can change it to anything you want. Let's say, for example, um, if I drop it at one and a half meters, so it's 1500 mils. So now here you have to go to this area and define a face edge or a plane that determines direction of gravity. And uh, you cannot click on this uh, Y of the triad. And uh, if you might say, well, can I uh, show the temporary axis and click on this one? The matter of fact is it is not going to grab that. So either you have to create a sketch for it or as I did in this case, I just made a small flat surface, very small on the top. So I can choose that for the direction of gravity. It's all up to you how you determine that. So if I click here, the normal to that uh, flat plane is going to be the direction of gravity. If that's not right, you can reverse it. You can determine the gravitational acceleration. And now here you come and talk about the target surface, the surface that this ball is going to hit. So uh, do you want it to be parallel to a, re uh, a reference plane or normal to gravity, which is right below this? Let's keep it as is. And then here, there are a bunch of parameters. One of them is the friction coefficient. Do you want it to consider a friction coefficient? Now, uh, this is good if the ball is not directly dropping normal to the plane. Okay, this one is normal. Uh, drop on the plane so uh, the uh, lateral friction is not going to play such a huge role right but if it, it was to come at angle it might uh, momentarily uh, have a very very small effect on one of the components of the uh, momentum of the uh, object so uh, this number is not going to affect in this case anything so i'm not going to change it and then do you want the target to be rigid or flexible? If you keep it as rigid, then uh, basically the amount of uh, stress in the part is going to be a little bit higher because the target surface is not going to absorb uh, a, a lot of basically um, 
energy, uh, initial energy of the part which is coming directly from kinetic energy, right? In terms of, uh, it's not gonna absorb a bunch of that in terms of the strain energy. And so uh, the, uh, if there is any deformation, it is going to be uh, entirely on the part itself, which causes higher levels of stress. So here I'm gonna do it in two different ways. First, I do it rigid target, then I change it to flexible target. And then here is a damping uh, coefficient. Uh, do you want the damping? Damping means you are going to lose energy, okay? And uh, in almost all realistic cases in life, there is a damping, right? Damping is kind of like a difference between uh, number one and what we call the coefficient of restitution, which we have in impacts. If you uh, remember from your dynamics, if you release a, a ball from uh, height h, first of all, the velocity of it right before collision is going to be uh, square root 2gh, correct? So uh, here that we uh, release it at 1.5 meters, 2 times that times g, this is going to be about like 30, so it's a square root 30, which is 5 point something meters per second, like 5.5, 5.6 meters per second. So you could do it that way. And we also had this coefficient of restitution. So if the object hits the ground with velocity v, then when it bounces back, assuming that the ground is completely uh, uh, solid, like this case, or uh, no deformation in it, so when the ball hits the ground right before the impact with velocity v, then it is going to bounce back with velocity v prime, which is equal to e times v. Of course, the sign of them is different. So if v is negative, v prime is positive, right? That's why in many dynamics book, you always use that negative sign here if you want to include the sign for v and v prime. But in magnitude, the magnitude of it goes to e times v, and this e, as you know, is a number typically between 0 to 1. Can this e be, between, be more than 1? Not really, unless the surface kind of gives a tremendous amount of energy to this object, or like the object hits the surface and kind of explodes or something like that, or the surface generates a lot of energy. Typically, this number is between 0 to 1. Zero means it sticks to the surface and does not bounce back. So you have like a lot of glue or something and it's not dropping so fast so it's not going to bounce back. One means uh, it's going to bounce back with the same magnitude of velocity so we call it perfectly elastic impact. There is no deformation in the part that is permanent and uh, typically for most life applications this E is between zero to one. So when E is less than 1, you definitely get a smaller velocity. So if it comes from this height, next time it is going to go up to a smaller height and then hits again and then goes to smaller height. And then you see this kind of damped behavior until it loses all of its energy to the floor and then comes to a, a stationary uh, position. So as I said, in most real life applications, when this E is not equal to one, the difference between E and one is kind of what you can consider like a damping, right? Because that determines the difference between E and one, that how fast this um, basically a bouncing is going to be damped. So if I go back here, let's say E for my case is like uh, 0.7, so the difference between that and one is like 0.3. That's the amount of damping that I have. And by the way, E, this coefficient of restitution, uh, can be determined in very, very theoretical cases from the properties of the material and the surface. So if we assume, if, we assume that the ball and the surface, the target surface, are from the same material. Now, that does not happen often. But if they are the same, and if the velocity of the uh, object uh, before impact is V and the other surface is stationary, then the theoretical coefficient of restitution can be uh, calculated by this formula here. It is a function of the yield strength of the material. It is a function of the Young modulus. It's a function of mu, the Poisson's ratio. It's a function of the velocity, 
right before impact and the density of the material. So clearly, the harder that you hit, which means the bigger the velocity is, you definitely see that E is going to go down. So harder impacts, faster collisions, always have a smaller E, and smaller E means a lot of energy is going to be uh, used for deformation of the surfaces, and a, a smaller amount of that is going to be given back to the part for rebouncing. Right, so E does depend on VE is not really completely independent from the impact velocity. Also, it depends on the material, right? The heavier the material is, the smaller the E is going to be. The uh, bigger the Young modulus, the smaller the E, right? The bigger the uh, Poisson's ratio, again, the smaller the E and the um, bigger this yield uh, strength, the bigger the E. And this formula is only valid for a range of velocities, as so long as rho v squared over sy is between 10 to the negative 3 and 10 to the negative 1. Okay, so uh, E again theoretically be calculated. Now it doesn't mean that um, really uh, in practice, you can always use this formula, but just wanted to mention this formula for you. Uh, and I do not think SOLIDWORKS is using that formula here. So if that's all the case, my setting is done. Now I right click on the mesh and say mesh and run. Let's do it all together. And when you do that, then it is going to show you the stresses on each and every one of the uh, mesh points on this ball due to collision. Now, this is not necessarily a simple task, although the setting of it was simple, but mathematically, really, uh, doing finite element analysis and calculating the collision forces, the stress, and so on, is not necessarily the simplest task of all. So you see, it is taking some time out of my computer to get it done. So here you can see the one mice's stress levels. And you see, if there are red spots, the stress in them is huge. It's 3.249 giga Pascal, which is huge really, okay? So where can that happen? We have to go look at the bottom of the part where the collision is happening and you see there are spots here that can go as high as that and the yield strength for this material is only 200 and what 50 meg while the stress at those points is like what uh, uh, instead of 250 is like 3 3200 so it is like um more than an order of magnitude higher than yield string. So definitely you will have some big deformations over there, especially the fact that the uh, floor is considered rigid. Now, do we have any rigid, completely rigid floor? No, not really. So although it shows that failure would definitely happen at the bottom of the object, but again, do not think that that's completely realistic because the um, uh, surfaces, the target surfaces are never completely rigid. And here you can also do animation on that, right? So this is basically the stress level, right? Which happens in a very, very small time during the collision. And uh, you also see that um, the collision time, it shows you it is 20.6 microseconds. Okay, so that's the, the duration of the impact that FEA estimates. And the scale is of deformation is 1 to 1. So you really do not have like a ton of deformation if you go to displacement and animate that. The scaling is not really huge. You see kind of the part kind of gets open over there, right? Let me make it a little bit slower so you can see it better. Okay, you see the deformation of the mesh in that area. But now, to make it more realistic, I would go back to the setup and I'll try to make the floor uh, non-rigid or flexible. So I go there 
and now what I do here, you can determine a stiffness for the surface, both in vertical and horizontal. Again, since the impact is perfectly vertical here, I only go with a, a stiffness that is vertical. So I go with the 100 uh, Newton per meter per meter squared. As I said, no horizontal or tangential needed. Then we have a mass density. And here, let's go with the mass density of uh, rubber or something like that. So let's say uh, 1200 and then a thickness. So let's say, for example, like uh, 30 mils. Right, so now I make the surface a lot nicer, right, a lot more flexible. And uh, before I run the analysis for you, so here what SolidWorks is trying to do is to basically determine the equation of motion for the object during the impact using a mass spring damper system, right? That's why you see that. It is asking for a damping coefficient. Basically, it is asking for a stiffness coefficient, and then it will determine everything else. The mass of the object it knows, the acceleration can be determined by the changes in velocity and so on. It can look at the change in the position and so on, and then any other force that uh, really exists. So, uh, if that's the case and you okay that and run the study again now this time you should be expecting to have smaller amounts of stress and deformation so now if you look you see the level of stress is uh, quite a bit smaller much smaller i would say and the distribution of the stress as well so the uh, distribution of the stress is not going to be the same why because the part will penetrate the flexible objects and so it's not just the very bottom of the part that is going to be affected by collision and uh, be exposed to some force when the part is submerged into the flexible part and uh, kind of penetrate through it a little bit although it bounces back later but now the uh, uh, sides the faces of the uh, flexible object will exert force on different points on this ball and that's why you see stress spread uh, a little bit more than just very very local thing that you had with the rigid body right but the level of stress is significantly less compared to 10 to the power 9 now you have 10 to the power 5 and you clearly see there is no sign of even a um, an elastic much of an elastic deformation very small because this number is far less than the yield strength okay so i hope this brief introduction uh, is useful to you and show you basically how to do how to perform a simple um, drop test in solidworks and look at the displacement, stress, strain, and uh, calculate with SOLIDWORKS the uh, approximate time of the collision. So thank you so much for your attention, and I will see you in my next video.